Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and we welcome you again to this uh, third lecture of our 2001 lecture series. It's presented by the Panetta Institute for Public Policy and by California State University, Monterey Bay. And we again are here in my hometown of Monterey at the Monterey Conference Center. Just a quick reminder for those of you that uh, make use of our intermission, please do take a ticket stub with you uh, during the intermission for your re-entry. Re the theme of this lecture series, uh, as I've mentioned before, is preparing for the 21st century. We focused on governing, on technology, and last year on the presidency. This year we focus on people and politics in the 21st century. Tonight, we look at the people, generations, past, present, and future. We have two guests who have a broad range of experience that gives them each, I think, a very distinctive perspective on the impact of changing values, of changing generations, and changing lifestyles in our society. In a very real way, they are the faces we associate with life in the America of 2001. Our first guest is perhaps one of the most well-known news anchors in the nation. For nearly two decades, he has been the sole anchor for the NBC Nightly News. And during that time, he has amassed a whole series of firsts and been honored with almost every major journalism award. He was first to conduct an exclusive interview with Mikhail Gorbachev, first to report on human rights abuses in Tibet, first to interview the Dalai Lama, first anchor to report from the scene the night the Berlin Wall came down, first from the Oklahoma City bombing site, and on and on. He's covered every presidential election since 1968. He was a White House correspondent. He was host for the Today Show and has anchored the nightly news from almost <clears throat> every corner of the globe, from the White House to the Great Wall to the rooftops of Beirut to Somalia and to so many other places around the world. He's done a series of primetime specials on issues, critical issues facing our nation, from race and religion to violence and politics. But his special focus has been on the World War II generation. After some moving interviews with veterans at Normandy for the 40th anniversary and then for the 50th anniversary as well, he was inspired to write his best-selling book, The Greatest Generation. It's an account of that generation of Americans born in the 20s, survived the Depression, fought in World War II, and then helped build a nation. He followed up with another bestseller as a result of tremendous correspondence he received on his first book with that called The Greatest Generation Speaks. He's written numerous essays and articles and commentaries, has been honored with two Emmy Awards, a Peabody, and received the American Legion's top award for distinguished public service. But more important, to understand this individual, you have to look at his roots. And his roots are in the heartland of America. He grew up in South Dakota. He graduated from the University of South Dakota and began his journalism career in 1962 in Omaha. He and his wife, Meredith, met when they were 15 years old and have enjoyed nearly four decades of marriage. They have three daughters, each with a successful career. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming someone that many of us see in our living room each evening, NBC's nightly news anchor, Tom Brokaw.
Our other featured guest is really no guest at all. He's a familiar part of the family that we all enjoy in this wonderful area of ours. But he also happens to be one of the most recognized movie stars in the world. Beginning more than 40 years ago, he's appeared in 54 feature films and starred in 46 of those films. His skills extend far beyond acting. He's an award-winning director, an accomplished producer, and he often wears the hats of actor, director, and producer simultaneously. He's been recognized with Academy Awards for Best Director and Best Picture for the movie Unforgiven in 1992, which really starred our local supervisor at the time, Sam Karras. <laughs> but Sam, Sam didn't get an Academy Award. <laughs> Our speaker received the Irving Thalberg Award. He's a fellow of the British Film Institute. He's received the American Film Institute's Lifetime Achievement Award, and most recently was honored with the Kennedy Center Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Performing Arts. He was born in San Francisco, raised along the West Coast. He got his start in Hollywood after being cast as Rowdy Yates in Rawhide. This led to a series of starring roles in a string of famous spaghetti westerns the most famous of which was Bono il Bruto il Cattivo. <laughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly. Which could be a title for politics in America, I guess. In 1971, he made his debut as Dirty Harry with a line that every actor craves. Go ahead, make my day. He's played every role from cat burglar and gunnery sergeant to secret service agent and detective, from Texas Ranger and Western outlaw and preacher to news reporter, National Geographic photographer, and recently an aging astronaut in Space Cowboys, which is available at your local video store. <laughs> but that's the Hollywood role. More important for us in this community is his role as a friend to the Monterey Peninsula. He came here during his service in the Army when he was stationed at Fort Ord. And he came back to live here and become a part of this community. He's been mayor of Carmel, chairman of the Monterey Peninsula Foundation, an organization, as you all know, that supports literally hundreds of local charities and hosts the AT&T Pro-Am at Pebble Beach. He serves on the board of the Monterey Jazz Foundation. He's active in historic preservation, the Carmel Heritage Society, the Big Sur Land Trust, and he saved, as we all know, the historic Mission Ranch. He's a partner and board member of the Pebble Beach Company, which owns the Lodge at Pebble Beach, the Inn at Spanish Bay, and four of the most beautiful golf courses in the world. And he recently completed his own new course and club at Tehama, a course that is littered with my golf balls. <laughs> he makes his home here with his wife, another familiar face, and former news anchor, Dina Ruiz Eastwood, and their daughter, Morgan. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a friend and a fellow citizen, Clint Eastwood. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, let me start off, uh, Tom, with uh, focusing right on your book, The Greatest Generation. Uh, Tom's written about it, and Clint has played uh, the role in movies. Uh, Tom concludes in his book that, and I quote, this is the greatest generation any society has produced, unquote. That covers, obviously, a lot of history. And so my question, Tom, is when you think about our founding fathers and those, those who fought the revolution, when you think about those who wrote our Constitution, fought in the Civil War, to the United Nation, built the railroads, raced up San Juan Hill, fought in World War I, fought in Korea, fought in Vietnam, why is this generation the greatest? 
Well, the short answer is that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> 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 It's obviously a provocative title. Uh, I said it uh, almost spontaneously in 1994 to Tim Russert on Meet the Press when I was in D-Day for the 50th anniversary and he was back in Washington. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought it was a defensible proclamation on my part. Because this generation, men and women, it really was so inclusive in what they did, beginning with the Depression, surviving that, and uniting either within families or communities or within regions and certainly as a nation to get through that very trying period without having a real revolution in America. Think about it. And just when there was some hope that that economic despair would begin to lift, this same generation was asked to go off to distant battlefields in Europe or in the Pacific, the men, and to fight hand-to-hand -hand primitive conditions while their wives their fathers and mothers back at home kept the nation together and made enormous sacrifices. Weren't perfect. Too slow to recognize uh, the need to do something about gender equality. Far too slow to deal with racial discrimination. But met every challenge put before them, which were monumental, and always understood that we work best as an immigrant nation when we move constantly toward a higher common ground. Now, the founding fathers and that generation were brilliant, but they were all mostly white males. Women really didn't have a role in the founding of the country, and they allowed the institution of slavery to go forward at that time. Same thing could be said of the Civil War generation. Deeply divided nation, people defending the right of this country to continue slavery and to break up the idea of the federal system as we knew it. So I have concluded that this was the greatest generation, that it met the greatest test. John Keegan, who is a brilliant British military historian, has said of World War II, quite simply, it was the largest event in the history of mankind. It was fought on six of the seven continents and all of the seas and in the air. Fifty million people died when it was over. Nations were realigned and cultures were destroyed. And this generation was in the thick of it. And when it came home, it built the country that we have today and rebuilt their enemies. The first time that had ever been done. So that's a longer answer to my original statement. That's my story and I'm speaking to it. <laughs> Clint, you were, uh, you were born in 1930, you were raised during the Depression years, you were a young boy during World War II. Do you think it was the greatest generation? Well, I'm, I am the son of the, of the greatest generation, so uh, yes, I think so. I, I think for all the reasons that um, uh, Tom was mentioning, I, I think the Depression years were a very depressed time, and, and uh, in this period is something that... Uh, Generations since then have never had to uh, to uh, endure. Um, I think um, I think uh, the the f the fight in World War uh, II, the kind of resolve that these people had, everybody going to war, everybody going to work in war efforts, uh, is quite uh, is quite impressive. I haven't seen anything since then. And as I mentioned this afternoon when we were talking, I, I think that was the last time America has been united at, in that force to overcome uh, a common enemy. I, there's been the Korean War, which came along later, and the Korean War was, uh, was the first indication that we were willing to fight wars that we were maybe not sure we were going to win or we were going to compromise out on. Uh, Vietnam became even more so. And, and so at, at, at this point in time, that was the last great victory and, uh, and, and a necessary victory. I guess the, the, the vast necessity for it is what kept it, uh, is what kept it going and, and, and makes it so extraordinary. But um, when uh, uh, I, I too have uh, got up one morning in Deauville, um, in Deauville and drove over to the uh, Normandy beachhead with the uh, late Frank Wells, a close friend of mine, 
And we were there at the time of the invasion in the morning, and it was so mystical. And it was just almost like you could hear the landing barges coming forward. And you see the pillboxes, everything's still there. It's very undeveloped. And, the, and uh, then you go up and you see that graveyard up there, and it's the most uh, heart-wrenching thing you can imagine. And that makes you, gives you a tremendous appreciation for the people who uh, made these sacrifices. And uh, to have to go through the Depression years, uh, which, we, which didn't have any uh, welfare, didn't have any uh, unemployment insurance, when you were broke, you were broke, and that's all there was to it. And, uh, and, and then they have to go right into that kind of uh, war. They, they endured a lot. I mean, I, I mean obviously, these were, these were heroes, as you point out. There was, a, there was an article in this morning's local paper called Heroes Are Victims, <clears throat> kind of an interesting story. Uh, but the quote that I want to mention to you is a quote by a fellow who was a World War II Pacific Theater combat veteran when I think it was his wife uh, wanted to say she wanted to watch the heroes coming home, the 24 U.S. service men and women in China. And the response of this World War II Pacific Theater combat veteran was, heroes? What heroes? Nobody knows the difference anymore. They're not heroes, they're victims. They were hit by another plane, period. You want to know about heroes? Read about the men who fought on Iwo Jima. Talk to the guys who landed on Normandy. Are these heroes or victims? I think they were victims. Uh, I think we're uh, too quick to apply uh, heroic stature to someone who does something that's not necessarily heroic. Uh, I've arrived at my own definition of what a hero is. Um, I. My, and this grows out of my experiences with the greatest generation listening to their stories. Let me just say quickly, parenthetically, none of them has ever identified himself or herself to me as a hero or a heroine. They always say the same thing. I wasn't a hero, but I had a buddy who was, and he didn't come home. Or there was a guy who saved my whole outfit. I didn't even know his name. He was a hero. So they have a very strong idea of what real heroism is. And for me, it is someone who is quite ordinary, who rises to extraordinary heights of great courage to do something on behalf of others, a selfless act. That, for me, is the definition of heroism. And these members of the greatest generation, both at home and abroad, were witness to the truest act of heroism. And so I can understand why they're now frustrated with the casual use of the word hero, and we apply it even in sports, and we apply it uh, to casually in communities. But it is, I think, a special status, and we ought to reserve it for those who have earned it in the truest sense of the word. That is not to take away from the very difficult circumstances that these 24 men and women were placed in. But one of the things that's happened in modern society is that we're too quick to make this a kind of hero, non-hero uh, judgment about people. Uh, and I w shudder to think about what happens if we're faced in America again with our younger generation with a real military confrontation of some kind. Remember the one pilot that was rescued during Bosnia, the one guy that went down, he was on the cover of Time magazine, he was paraded through the streets. He did what was expected of him. There were a hundred stories like that every day during World War II, every day. Uh, there's a wonderful new book out called In Harm's Way. It's about the sinking of the Indianapolis. There are breathtaking stories of heroism in that, and it was barely noticed at the time because it happened in the closing days of the war. So one of the things I do hope that will happen is that we'll have a kind of national dialogue about the application of the word hero, and also the word star. This is a star. I am not. This is a man who has earned, who has earned that acclamation. And there are, in my judgment, only a handful of them. But they're sprinkled like so much stardust now across the pop celebrity culture. And it's one of the dialogues that we ought to have within our national community about the application of these terms of higher stature. Uh, Clint, if, if, uh, if we had to go to war tomorrow, 
would this generation be able to respond the same way generation that Tom wrote about in his book? Well, if it was under the circumstances of World War II, where we had such a, a, an, an inspiring uh, or incentive, such as the bombing of Pearl Harbor, I'm sure that would shock the, the people into some sort of action. However, sometimes you must wonder if we'd have that kind of resolve, because we're living in this information age, people have so many more questions, and, and, and youth are much smarter than they were uh, in our era. At, at, a, at an earlier time in life uh, and they know so much more and they probably ask a lot of questions but um, I think that uh, yeah I think that they'd have the resolve I think uh, Americans uh, could and should should have that resolve hopefully they're never asked to do that again hopefully we can learn some lesson history doesn't prove that out uh, history doesn't show very good signs of that but at least uh, you hope that uh, a war in this in the sense of World War II would never happen again and then the hero idea, the, fellow, uh, the people on the Chinese, uh, that ate Chinese food for 11 days, or, it was, it, I mean, it was, it was a tough act. I think the pilot probably was very, very heroic in bringing it, being able to bring down a crippled aircraft, and uh, an aircraft that was in distress, but uh, uh, it was strictly a, a political decision. They had to wait out a little time, but I don't know if that's heroics in the same vein as some of the people that Tom writes about in his book, uh, Joe Foss. Uh, to name some of the more uh, known ones but, uh, and others. I mean, uh, you know, the nation obviously owes a lot to the World War II veterans, but it's also a fact that the nation made a huge investment in them as well. Uh, I mean, ultimately, the New Deal programs to some extent, the CCC, the GI Bill, the Social Security was created during the 30s. Uh, they, they clearly earned their service and duty to the nation, but it, they were called on to respond with service to this country. And I guess my, my question is, ought we to require of young people that they spend a period of time in national service to this country so that they understand what duty and discipline is all about as well? Before I answer that, let me amend my last remarks. Clint is quite right to point out that the pilot of the plane was certainly heroic in his actions in that situation. He was not a victim. And he did save the rest of the crew. Um, so I wouldn't want anyone to have the impression that I didn't think what he did was truly heroic. To go on to what, this question, uh, Leon, you know better than anyone in this room the cost of those kinds of programs uh, and the difficulty that you would have, the difficulty that you did have even with AmeriCorps uh, during the last eight years in trying to get that launched. My own belief is that since it's probably problematic uh, from a national point of view is that there ought to be many more programs that grow from the ground up around the country that provide an opportunity for service uh, for young people. I do think it's vitally important. I think there's a lot more of it going on than we sometimes give it this generation credit for participating in. Wherever I go, as I was saying earlier today to the students around the world, and I spent a lot of time in the third and fourth and fifth world, I find young Americans working in medical programs or with refugees, uh, or they're helping uh, nations uh, develop their political systems. So there is an appetite for it, and I think it's incumbent upon us, of those of us who are uh, a little older, to provide those opportunities for these young people if it's not going to come uh, from the national level, which I think is unlikely, probably from a political point of view. It's hard for me to imagine. That, um, that that will get started in the current or even in the foreseeable political climate. I think you're probably right. Clint, what do you think about returning to the draft or some kind of national service? You know, um, I hated, I was drafted and, uh, <laughs> uh, in 1951, uh, and I, I got to say I hated it. I, I was, uh, I, but at the same token, I look, like every other person who was in the military, I look back on the few years that I did as great, I look back on only the good part. I don't remember the bad part and uh, how unorganized it was. It introduced me to the Monterey Peninsula here, it, which has become my home. So I was fortunate enough to be stationed at Fort Ord instead of, Fort Benning, Texas, or, or Oklahoma, or where. <laughs> so uh, it, uh, you know, a little a luck has to play a factor. But I, I think to, to send kids to boot camp or a thing, it probably would be great for them. But whether you'd be able to do that, whether you'd be able to put that over 
on the families. Um, nowadays, I don't know if the families have the, the resolve to. The fa families were closer knit then, it seemed like, and people would, would uh, 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 the, the, the tightness of the families, you wonder with some of the uh, newsworthy incidents that have gone on in the recent history, uh, you wonder where the parents are in some of these situations like at Columbine and where have you, and, and it's very, very depressing sometimes, and you think, did we have that in the 30s and the 40s? I don't know, I guess we did. Everybody had their uh, tragic situations and tragic stories, but uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's a need to have a national draft for kids or something, maybe not. I'd rather see, I think education is the key. I'd rather see every kid inspired to go on to higher education, and education will be the answer to, to this country uh, 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 politically and in every other way. You raised uh, Columbine, uh, and now I think it's been two years since Columbine. You did a piece on your evening news indicating that Columbine continues to be a problem out there. Uh, even in this area, we've had schools closed because of threats of similar violence. Every time there are school shootings uh, and there's violence, uh, the issue comes up as to whether there's too much violence on television or in the movies. And I guess my question is, do you believe there is a relationship between the violence you see on television and the movies and what's happening with young people? I, uh, my belief is that there's uh, more of a connection between what young people see on the internet and behavior problems than what you see now generally on television or for that matter even in the movies. Uh, for those of you who don't go to the websites uh, that a lot of young people go to, it's pretty damn frightening. Uh, I did a, a documentary last year called Hate on the Web, uh, just about the hate websites, and there was a young man in Illinois who had become fascinated and drawn into a gospel of hate on the, on the internet and became an acolyte of a single operative uh, in Illinois and then went on a shooting spree in Illinois. I think it's almost directly traceable to the cancerous kinds of message that were transmitted on the internet. Um, television itself these days, I think, is less violent. I mean, if you look at the offerings on the networks, certainly, uh, it's mostly about friends and ER, and that's doing something good. There's a consequence for bad violence. Now, I do think that the so-called smackdown culture probably has an effect on some kids, but I don't think it prompts them to pick up a gun and go to school. I think that it's far more complicated than that. I think that a lot of these high schools have become too large. I think that there is a stratification that goes on and bullying happens and kids have access to guns and they um, copycat each other. We know that. Um, I've been making a lecture recently in which I talk about the beginning of the last century, 20th century, and the beginning of this one. In the beginning of the 20th century, they had all that technology there as well. They were very excited about automobiles and flight and telephones and everything else, thinking that would probably be the answer. 20th century gave us two world wars, Holocaust, Columbine at the end of it. So at the beginning of this century, as we get so excited about the new technology, what I've been saying it will do us little good to wire the world if we short circuit the soul. We have to be thinking simultaneously about who we are within ourselves as well as how we communicate with each other over this empowering new technology. And I don't think there's enough of a national dialogue about that. What do you think? Well, I think there is a correlation. I, I think t uh, I, th I think on one hand there's a correlation between violence seen on television and in movies. It's uh, there definitely whenever there's something is a hit. If there's a movie that's a hit, there's violence. Somebody's going to come along and try to exceed it. And what they do is they try to exceed the violent aspects instead of uh, tell a better story. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as Tom said, the copycat angle of television is rough because the media covers these things in such with such an insatiable appetite that they. <clears throat> they cover it and recover it and recover it, and these kids see themselves become overnight uh, names, even if they go out, uh, of, even if they go out and get killed in it. They see themselves going down in history, uh, whether it's uh, you know the John Lennon situation, or what have you, or, or, or the attempt of assassination on President Reagan. These guys are all inspired by something, and it's some attention 
They want some attention, and this information age has its downsides, and that was one of the downsides of it, is the glamorization, at least in, their, in sort of a sick mind. Uh, c compare, let, let's, what are the core values that you saw in the World War II generation that you think identified them as special? And how do you compare those values with the present generation? What's missing? Well, it's, you know, there's, it's always dangerous to make a generalization, but I, I think one of the things that you've found in the World War II generation, uh, there are four or five common values that you found in them. Uh, what they had, they earned, uh, for the most part, in, in the truest sense of that word. First, in the Depression, many of them dropped out of school to go to work for their siblings, to put clothing on their backs or put food on the table with their families. So they had a very keen sense of the truest value of the work ethic and the meaning of work and the return that you got for it and how you used it and how you shared it with others. I think that was a part of it. I think as well that there was this sense of a stronger sense of right and wrong, if you will. It doesn't mean that there weren't bad people during the World War II generation that they took advantage. But the lines were a lot clearer, uh, and you knew uh, within communities who was a bad guy and who was a good guy, and there was no celebration of the bad guy necessarily. You know, the people took great pride in family and working through problems. Um, there was as well, I think, within the World War II generation that grew out of their experience during the war of discipline and loyalty and common purpose. Uh, because that came out of the military effort and, and it also came out of the communities at home as people had to sacrifice things. They went without meat, without nylons, without other things because it was for the greater good. So, as I say, it's dangerous always to generalize about that, but it was more selfless, if you will, than selfish. I think that it uh, had a kind of built-in modesty about accomplishment because it had been witness to so much destruction and devastation, and it knew, as collectively as a generation, the enormous effort that went in for great accomplishment. Um, so I, I think probably honesty, hard work, um, modesty about their sense of accomplishment, and, a, and a, an inherent sense that you're expected to do right that you're expected to do the right thing. That's the collective. Obviously, there were people within that generation who didn't adhere to any of that. But by and large, I think that that was the overarching view of most people. Those values that you were raised with, Clinton, uh, let me ask you this, and ask both of you. Did you pass those values on to your children? I did, I think. I, I certainly... We, we've talked about this a lot. My children have been raised in a far different way than I was, um, just from a material point of view, and then where we have lived. I, uh, I have three daughters. Two of them were born in California. Two of them, by the way, went to school in California. One went to Berkeley, and I had one simultaneously at Stanford. Uh, I once described that in a public forum as like having one who's a member of the Grateful Dead and the other one who's a member of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was very well received at Berkeley, not so well received at Stanford. Um, but one of the things that we did with our children is that uh, the kids used to say in New York, we're the only ones in New York City without television sets in our room without our own telephones. And we said, well, we find it hard to believe you're the only ones, but that's going to go on for a while. And it, we only succumbed when the first two had been gone and the last one was at home and she knew everybody in New York and they were calling on our line. And so we finally uh, really begrudgingly conceded and gave her a telephone. But one of the things that we used to do was make sure that they went back to the Midwest in the summertime when they were in their formative years. And they went to camp in Minnesota and they spent time with their grandparents in the small town from which Meredith and I both came. Her, her father was a doctor of classic, wonderful uh, country physician type who came out of World War II 
and our eldest daughter is a doctor, I think in large part because of merit. He would take Jenny by the hand on rounds to the hospital and say, you're going to be the next doctor in the family. And she would see what it was like, hands-on healing process. Our middle daughter still talks about the time we were back in South Dakota at the, during the Christmas season, and there was a big blizzard, and they'd sold out all the sleds in town. And by then, all the sleds from our two families had been given away. My dad never missed a beat. He took Andrea down to his basement workshop, and within an hour had made a sled. <laughs> and she was wide-eyed by that. But that's how I had grown up. My mother had stopped saying that she needed things. She would just go buy them because she said if she needed them, he would go make them. And she was tired of having handmade ironing boards and uh, whatever it was. My God, he could make it better than they could produce it at Sears. So the kids were exposed to that. And they talk about it to this day, about having that life and seeing those families, my mother canning goods in the summertime from the large garden, counting her pennies when they went to the store, looking for the sales when they went to buy the kids' shoes. They are conscious of all that. doesn't mean that they practice it necessarily, but at least they're <laughs> conscious of it. So yeah, I did try to convey that to them, and I think that they grew up with it. One of the, uh, there's a wonderful story in, uh, in our family about my daughter, Jennifer, was about six and pretty talkative, and she was asked by her grandmother what she wanted for Christmas. And she said that she really wanted to have a stereo record player to play the records that, that she had. And my mother said to her, well, what did your father say about that? And my daughter said to her grandmother, Daddy says, my God, do you know how much those things cost? <laughs> 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 yeah, so I think I was conscious of it. Clint, I think uh, Clint's mother of 92 years is here this evening. So we'll have you. So how were you raised? <laughs> uh, mm. <laughs> Well, we had uh, an inter interesting. Uh, my my parents were uh, were uh, married, starting a family at the beginning of the depression. So it was a very difficult time. And I was born in San Francisco. Then we lived in Oakland, and we lived in Sacramento, and then we moved moved to Pacific Palisades. So my dad could get a job at a Standard Oil station. That was uh, the scarcity of jobs in that time was it was immense. And the, my sister was born in uh, Los Angeles, and then we moved back to Sacramento, and then we moved to, we moved to Spokane once for a while, and then, uh, but I was too young to hardly remember that. And then we moved to Redding, lived in Redding, uh, California, and I went to all these little schools, uh, the various schools in and out of them, and uh, uh, th <clears throat> they didn't know about dyslexia. And, and all, that, all that stuff then, they just thought, hey, this is interesting. You could try to catch up to this and fall back to that. But it was, uh, it was an interesting time, and uh, people, there was no welfare or, or anything like that. So uh, people would come to the back door and ask if they could cut up all the wood in the backyard to, uh, to earn a sandwich. That's all they wanted, a sandwich. They didn't want money. They knew he didn't, probably didn't have any. And uh, there was that kind of camaraderie and that kind of volunteer help that went on. And I think that's one of the things, getting back to where you were talking about <clears throat> World War II, I think that was the difference, is people volunteered. People volunteered to go into the military uh, at that time. And uh, then the first thing you learn when you're in the military is don't volunteer for anything. <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's very true, too, because, uh, you know, volunteer to... All those who uh, don't, how many people smoke? Okay, you guys watch the guys, other guys pick up the cigarettes and all that. And they had all kinds of tricks like that. But um, by and large, it was, uh, it was a, it, people were, were willing to help one another. And they, it wasn't so much a, a lit, litigious society that we live in now where everybody's at, uh, antagonistic towards our mistrusting of one another. And everybody now thinks if you're trying to do something that um, you're, you've got some ulterior motive. And that in those times, everybody was focused. And that war sort of focused everybody. 
and they all worked towards the same end and people would tolerate the neighbor's dog barking or what have you because <clears throat> they knew they were all working in the, uh, in, for the good of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Allied command. So it was just a different era. I don't know, think that era is here right now. And I, you asked earlier if it could be rejuvenated for this generation. Maybe so, but it would be a different way. We'd have to, we'd have to send a lot of lawyers to the front lines first. <laughs> 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 of course, I say that I say that with my lawyer here in the house, so uh, I'll probably get a big billing. And with that, that. Uh, <laughs> with that advertisement for the local attorneys, uh, we are uh, we have come to the end of the first part, and we will then uh, go on with uh, question and answer question and answers from the audience. Tom Brokaw. Have you ever compromised your beliefs in order to please the network you support? <laughs> what, do you, uh, what do you do when faced with this kind of situation? Well, I, you know, we're owned by a large uh, corporation that has lots of interests around the world, GE. Um, and this question is raised often. Uh, we have a very strong-willed uh, chief executive there who's uh, gotten a lot of attention for his success as Jack Welsh. Um, and what I always say in gatherings like this, I'm grateful for GE because it saved NBC. If he hadn't come in when he did and bought the company and applied the management techniques to it that he did, uh, I doubt that we would have survived uh, as a whole piece. Having said that, it's often awkward when GE is in the news. Um, and so my standing rule has been that if GE is in the news, even below what would be our normal threshold of including the story in the nightly news, we put it on. And I always say General Electric, the parent company of NBC News, and then describe, if it's just a brief item, why they were in the news, or if it's a longer item, then we have to deal with it. We're the only network that has done two stories about GE and PCBs in the Hudson River, for example, the only one. Um, it's a continuing difficult proposition. Um, I would rather have us owned by a pure media company. That doesn't exist anymore. In fact, it really never did. When RCA owned NBC, RCA was in the Hertz uh, rent-a-car business. They had uh, defense uh, contracts. Uh, they owned carpet companies for a while. They had a big consumer electronics division. Bill Paley, who was considered uh, the model uh, network uh, owner, he owned lots of other enterprises, and his focus always was on getting the biggest bang for his buck that he possibly could. What was different then from now, of course, is that the two networks, and ABC was not even a player in those days, the two networks represented a duopoly. They had no competition. They could do anything that they wanted to, and the money poured in. So there's a lot more running room now across the spectrum. There is a lot more competition, and it's made it more difficult. But I can say to you that I am absolutely confident of my own integrity. You know, when you self-police yourself, you're always more confident of it, obviously. <laughs> but in a newsroom, you have lots of people looking in on the decisions that are made and how it plays out at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, we go through some pretty spirited dialogues, and we have a lot of people who are examining our work on a daily basis, and I'm pleased to say that so far the integrity of NBC News is intact. Mr. Eastwood, uh, is the movie industry doing justice to history? Please comment on films need to amend history to tell a good story. Films needed? Uh, I think the, the point is that uh, do films need to amend history in order to tell a good story, or are they true to history? Uh, they do a lot of times. I don't, uh, I don't think they should amend history. Uh, it's more, it's, but they, there's a lot of license taken. Uh, as we've seen, there's been complaints about um, a, a lot of films as far as their accuracy uh, to, uh, to real incidents that uh, inspire them. Um, I suppose if it's, if it's just an inspiring deal, that's one thing. Uh, Tom told a story today about a fellow who climbed some cliffs, and, and, and I, right away I was visualizing Guns of Navarone. 
And, and obviously, the writer of Guns of Navarone was visualizing that when he read that incident uh, during World War II. So, uh, and, and that's a different case. That's fictional. But if they depicted it as true and then did it like Guns of Navarone, then I'd, I'd be slightly uh, insulted. I would rather see him st stick as close as they can because history gets tainted. It gets, it gets changed and diluted very quickly anyway. So why should movies uh, be the... Uh, Catalyst. Tom, I want to ask you the uh, same question uh, this afternoon. Those first 18 minutes of uh, Saving Private Ryan uh, in, in terms of that landing in Normandy, uh, when you talk to the World War II veterans, what's their reaction? Is that real, not real? I mean, what, what's, what's the sense? Well, first of all, a, a lot of combat veterans will not go see Private Ryan because it's too painful. And they've been told about what it's about, and they just said, I don't need to see it again on a big screen. I lived it. But those who landed, and they were consulted, um, many of them, uh, by Steven Spielberg and the filmmakers who landed on D-Day um, at zero hour, say that it was uncannily accurate in terms of the carnage and the chaos and the killing and the blood that was in the water that was going on. And they say the one thing that was missing was the smell of death and cordite. Cordite has a real distinctive sound, gunpowder. And they said that's the only thing that was missing. Then Clint also pointed out, which their other observation was, that those guys were too old. Um, the kids who landed on D-Day were 19 and 20. And uh, you know, Tom Hanks' unit was a lot older. Hanks says he never took his helmet off, in part because he didn't want people to see his receding hairline, because he knew he was too old. Um, <laughs> Then they have a lot of observations. I've been witness to this, where they've, where they've cornered Tom and, and, and Stephen and said, you had those guys wandering around the horizon, you know, profiles of silhouetted out, talking loudly to each other. They'd have been dead in about the first 10 minutes of the film. <laughs> you had it all screwed up. So they've, they've gotten that uh, uh, course correction, obviously, from the people who landed there. But those who landed there say that's exactly what it was like. So think about that for a moment, and think about it going on most of the day, and Iwo Jima was worse. We had last year at uh, the D-Day Museum a medic who landed in the first wave at Normandy, and then landed on the first wave at Iwo Jima. His son had called me before the D-Day Museum and said, I'm bringing my dad down there. If I bring him down, could he meet you? And he was a, a friend of a friend, and I said, sure. So we got him in there, and his son came over to me and said, my dad has told me on the way down here that he landed first wave, both invasions. Well, when I heard that, I went over and got Stephen Ambrose and got everybody else around, and it, and it was absolutely true. And it was this mild-mannered little man who had never told his son that he had been in both invasions, and he said Iwo Jima was worse. Yeah. Well, Iwo Jima took place over over three and a half weeks, I think, yeah. and, and of, of being pinned down on the, the beaches, beaches and, and up there. So they, that was kind of an ultimate nightmare. Uh, but uh, there's another good book besides uh, Tom's book. Uh, there's a Flags of Our Fathers, which tells the story of about a, 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 a man who was a medic on Iwo Jima and, and, and all through the South Pacific, and then how they much uh, re reminded me a little bit of our story of Bridges, Madison County, and the set, not, no romance. So. <laughs> but but the, the children find out after the fact by going through the, the material in the attic, and they find out how heroic their father really was. And it's a wonderful story. In fact, Spielberg has, has uh, grabbed the rights to that. Uh, I know because I tried to get him myself. <laughs> by, the way, by the way, that goes back to something we talked about earlier. Uh, the, the principal in, in Flags of Our Fathers, which is a wonderful book, that father never thought that he was a hero simply because he helped raise the flag in Iwo Jima. Right. And that's the cause that he had during the course of his lifetime. He said that, and, you know, two of those men, I think it was two, were killed almost instantly yeah. after that. Um, five and, of them didn't come back. And yeah. five didn't come back. They yeah. just didn't feel, just because they were putting up a flag, they were not heroes. They just happened to, uh, by happenstance, end up in this memorable... Uh, emblematic photo of what was going on. Well, the irony was that the, they, they raised the flag and, and all the officers wanted to be in it, so they raised the flag with a bunch of officers all standing there posing, and then somebody, some admiral said, the flag's too small, 
So they sent it back, and the officer said, oh, hell with it. This time, right. so the bunch of enlisted men raised it right. the right. second that time, the and the second time was the picture, the famous picture. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say something parenthetically about <laughs> Clint, Clint and I are up here on this stage, and I was thinking about it. I was looking at his mother, and I was thinking about the way that he, he is just a couple of years older than I am, about how we were raised in such a common fashion. We first met back in the very early 1970s when we were both invited to a celebrity ski race uh, at a place called Bear Valley, California, which they were trying to develop at the time. And Clint was a big star then. And, <laughs> but he had just started skiing, and so had I. <laughs> but the fact is that we were so thrilled to have a free ski weekend that we went and made utter fools of ourselves for three days because we got it for nothing. Yeah. And I, it, it just occurred to me tonight, the reason we showed up is that they were giving us all this free equipment and yeah. a free chance to go skiing. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And they described, they described our style of going down through the gates. Why we did this is beyond me. Because we both... I, we could I've have been, been killed. I've been... <laughs> <laughs> At one, at one point, the announcer said that Clint Eastwood, coming down through the gates, he said his style is a series of linked recoveries. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that we were raised the same way because we thought, even though we can't ski, this is a free deal. We're not going to pass it up. <laughs> it's, it's, it's sort of like tonight. We, we knew we were going to get a book from Dan Albert. Right. <laughs> 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 Mr. Eastwood, to what, to what extent does the idea of a positive role model affect what movie roles you've agreed to, uh, to take and play? Well, I, I don't uh, always t uh, take roles that are positive role models. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've, I've sort of become reasonably well known without, by taking the antagonistic, or playing the antagonist, uh, and I, I think I got uh, what happened in the in the fifties, late fifties, early sixties, as I played sort of uh, Rowdy Yates' trail flunky on uh, Rawhide, and I was kind of got tired of being the sidekick who went along and asked the dumb questions, and uh, and, and and got and, and looked perplexed at the answers when they came back. So when I got a chance to to uh, to do a Western remake of a film that I was a great admirer of, which was Akira Kurosawa's uh, Yojimbo, which I'd seen in the mid-50s in the theater and thought this would make a great Western, but nobody had had the nerve to do it. I thought, well, this will be great. And so I, I played it as, as grungy as I possibly could. And then all of a sudden, the so people associated with me, they liked me grungier, much better than they did otherwise. <laughs> So it kind of worked out that way, and one thing led to another, and then I did other roles. And I, I, so I found out that, uh, that it, by playing a little bit of uh, conflict or somebody who was uh, more from a blue-collar or less background, uh, I could uh, have more of an identification with the audience. Now, that wasn't all planned. It's just that they're much more enjoyable roles to play. Uh, uh, your, your last films uh, have dealt with kind of growing old, whether it was... Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Unforgiven was, was part of that, Line of Fire, uh, certainly you know, Space Cowboys is, is a story of that. Yeah, are you trying to say that growing old is, uh, it, it, is a tragic uh, consequence of life, or <laughs> it, is, it, uh, is it like wine, older is better? No, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, uh, t uh, no, I'm just trying to uh, be realistic is and play, <laughs> and play roles that were, are within my uh, scope. I can sit, sit there and say, yeah, I know you have a very lovely makeup lady in the back, but she doesn't have a belt sander. There's nothing, <laughs> there's, 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 there's only so much she can do. So uh, uh, when I figured, uh, and, and it looks kind of ridiculous when a person's trying to play uh, much younger than they are, and they, they used to do that in the old days a lot of times. But I, I figure it's fun to play. I mean, what's the advantage of growing older is to be wiser and to play roles that encompass a little bit more uh, of a conflict. Maybe like in The Line of Fire, was, he was overcoming uh, being physically out of shape and not as strong yeah. as maybe yeah. he was when he was uh, younger. And the same thing with the uh, Space Cowboys. And this was, uh, this is, is fun to play. It just, um, and, and if you can be a role model in the sense that you're taking and making 
uh, people feel, uh, you, yeah, it's it's great to grow old if you enjoy it and if you can uh, if you can and get the best best part of it. Uh, keep yourself in modest uh, condition and and have a ball. Uh, Mr. Brokaw, uh, you've uh, covered uh, a lot of presidents. Uh, which president uh, did you admire the most, and how is the current president doing in Washington? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take the second part of that question first. I think he's doing okay. Um, I don't think um, I don't think that we have enough of an opportunity to take the full measure of him yet. Um, uh, somebody that uh, Leon and I know well, who is a very uh, shrewd uh, Democratic political operative, said to me the other night, he's, the smartest thing that uh, George W. has done is stayed on page four and not on page one. I think that's a pretty apt way of describing uh, yeah, what has worked good. well for him. He got some air cover in the first three weeks of his administration from all the difficulties that Bill Clinton was having. But now the real test is coming. You know, the, the tax bills before the House, that's a big test. Um, uh, he's gotten off on the wrong foot on the environment, primarily through a kind of uh, clumsiness more than anything else, both on arsenic in the water and CO2 especially, and they're trying desperately to to write him on that because the polls are pretty devastating. Um, he is what he is. I mean, he's this kind of amiable man who has a strong sense of his, uh, of his objectives in office. Um, there's this, uh, John Ashcroft, his attorney general, spoke at the uh, gridiron dinner and said uh, we're committed to a work week of 24 7 in this administration 24 hours a week seven uh, weeks a month i mean seven <laughs> weeks a, seven months a year I blew it, but and he he has he gets up reasonably early goes to the office and then goes home early and he always works out every day and he's at camp david every weekend because he's a great delegator so i think it's too early to say um what we can expect from him. It is more corporate, obviously, than it had been in the past, and it's more formal as a presidency. Uh, the lines are more carefully drawn in the White House as I deal with it. Presidents that I've admired, the one that I admire the most, I, I probably wouldn't, in, in the, certainly in public before this audience, settle on just one. Um, I think it's inappropriate for someone who has the job that I do to go public with that and say, yeah, I like that one best. And then, and then somebody would say, well, if you like him the best, you know what he thinks about that. Um, so, um, I, you know, I found all of them uh, interesting. Um, I, I think that their skills and their flaws are obvious to most of us at this point in life. I will say this. It takes an enormous amount of courage to run for president. I've, I've been close witness to that. And we ought not to be dismissive of the idea of people who come into the public arena, as Leon did, to run for Congress and then to become a conspicuous figure in our national leadership. Because they are really a reflection of all of us to one degree or another. And we have to think more carefully, it seems to me, about the conditions that we help create to either bring people into the arena or to drive them from it. When you think about running for president, it is a four-year proposition. You know, Al Gore, I think, is thinking now about what he's going to do three, four years out. So are a lot of others. They're lining up their support. They're making visits to Iowa and New Hampshire. They're going around trying to determine what their positions are going to be because it's a daunting task to lead a, the greatest nation in the world. And they deserve our attention, not support necessarily, but they certainly deserve our attention. It's a serious job, it takes serious people uh, a long time to think about doing it. When they go about it, then it requires the rest of us to examine them in a thoughtful fashion. That's all I wanted to say about it. And that has nothing to do with where they fall on the political spectrum, by the way. Clint? Well, I, <clears throat> I think he's, uh, I agree on the environment thing. He's been very, very clumsy. I think he, he could have easily, uh, just, it's easy to hindsight these things, but I would have couched the, uh, the uh, carbon dioxide 
uh, with the fact that, yes, we talked about it, uh, yes, we're going to get to it, but w right now we want to get a handle on the energy crisis and, and, the, and made a vow to at least get to it and get back to it when, he, uh, when they feel uh, they can get this energy thing uh, under, under the road. But I, I think the handling of the Chinese thing was, was as well done as you could do it. And, and, I, and the, like Tom says, the tax thing will be a, a very interesting interesting time. A good delegator. I think he's going to be as good as, as the people he surrounded himself with. And I think most people, Democrats and Republicans alike, agree that he surrounded himself with some pretty good people. If they shine, he'll shine. And if they don't shine, it'll be, uh, reflect badly on them. Do you think, uh, I guess this is addressed to both of you, do you think younger generations have grown apathetic to the needs of this country and are feeling a part, yes, are feeling not a part of the United States, and why? How can we change this? It's deadly. We did at the institute. We did a poll of uh, college students, and the poll showed that 73 percent of those that we polled would never choose a career in public life or public service. Yeah. Uh, 80 percent said they never even had a conversation with an adult about getting involved in public life. And it was interesting, we've just done a poll we're going to release in about a week. I'll give you a little head start. 94% did not volunteer for any political campaign. Ah, military 90, people. 94%. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, is the younger generation turned off with uh, politics in America? Yeah, I think they are turned off with politics. I think that the, if you look at this last campaign at the presidential level, uh, uh, neither candidate talked about the uh, issues that are of concern to young people. Um, there was almost no discussion about the place of cyber technology in our lives, uh, about uh, access to the internet and what we ought to be doing with it, about the role of technology in solving some of the problems that are of concern to young people. There was very little discussion about some of the issues, other issues that are of great concern to them, the international environmental issues. Uh, it was a campaign that was focused on those electoral states that, that we ended up settling the election over and playing to the special interest groups that were going to drive those states, labor, teachers groups, uh, Latinos in Florida, especially uh, the conservative Christian base, and other people were kind of marginalized. So I think that had something to do with it. Um, there was a time when I was growing up when when patriotism and loyalty and feeling for country was much more of a black and white issue than it is now, I think. Uh, this country hasn't been in a crisis in a way that people feel a kind of national commitment to something, a calling, if you will. I think one of the things that's happened, frankly, in, in Washington is that there aren't very many young people who are going to be called to Washington to reform na Social Security, as I've been saying. They don't feel the call to public service, for example, over uh, the estate tax, which these are the issues that are before the land right now. You know, when I was coming of age, it was about civil rights in Vietnam, and, uh, uh, and you felt affected by those issues. I don't think young people feel affected by the issues that are being discussed in Washington these days. What do you think? Why are people turned off? Um, why, uh, why, I don't know, but I think that they've got to get involved. And the only way they're going to get it, uh, get, it's the, you get the politics you deserve, and if you're willing to stand by and we're willing to, to go election after election where uh, less than a third of the people elect uh, our, major, uh, our major candidates, uh, then, then there's something wrong with that. And uh, people, and then this last, of course, this last election, there was tremendous conflict about the closeness, and it got down to where it was very, very close. So now people are maybe hope this is a wake-up call that everybody should get involved. I, I recommend uh, when I was mayor of Carmel, I tried to I'd go around and speak to young presidents' clubs and various organizations to try to get high-quality businessmen and, and and women to get involved in politics and to volunteer the time. But most people don't want to because there's no. Uh, there's not the money in it. They didn't want to be involved. They're in an economy that's going pretty well. They want to make hay while the sun shines so that they can build their own retirement. A lot of people don't want to, like Tom's saying, uh, Social Security. Uh, younger people don't think about that. Younger people aren't 
getting as involved with, like the, the unions in the old days used to offer uh, benefit plans. A lot of young people don't care about that. They say, we want to, we'll take care of the, we'll take care of the retirement. You just get me what I can now. And so the, 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 the focus has changed a lot. But I think if you want, um, if you want uh, a good quality people, and you've got to, you've got to support them. And you've got to get out and encourage people to run. If you find somebody, I, I know I used to go around and try to, to talk people in Carmel to run. When I decided not to run the second term, I, I had a hard time finding somebody. I said, come, please, somebody come uh, run here. Uh, we, we, we can't have the same people all the time. Because you get the same two or three people, and then they end up running the community. They all get their own little interest. And most of the time, their motivations sometimes are wrong. They're in there for the wrong reason. They're in there because they love a little bit of power to wield over somebody instead of really wanting to do something for the populace. And, and this, is a, this is a hard thing. But if you get those kind of people, it's, it's our fault if we get those kind of people. Do you think that because so many members of the uh, greatest generation were the children or grandchildren of immigrants, their sense of the value of their living and prospering in the United States was greater than that of today's generation? Do I think that the current generation? That because so many members of the greatest generation were the children, I guess, or grandchildren of immigrants that came uh -huh. to this country, that their sense of value of their living and prospering and probably working hard, the work ethic, uh, is, was greater than that of today's generation. Well, I think it was a combination of experiences. I think it had something to do with the fact that they were, many of them, uh, the offspring of, uh, of of immigrant parents who came here seeking the American dream of freedom and uh, and material gain and they earn that on a day by day month by month basis I also think that the times and the conditions had something to do with it um, when I think about even my lifetime about uh, how much has changed in terms of what constituted prosperity what constituted prosperity in the small towns in which I grew up was a Buick, uh, <laughs> frankly, you know. Uh, not two cars, one, a Buick. Everybody else was either a Chevy family or a Ford family. You didn't move much beyond that. And the idea of a second house, a second home, I said earlier today that among my peers from the small town in which I grew up in South Dakota, working class community, in our reunion of two classes recently, probably a third of the people who returned had second homes somewhere and two or three cars and had traveled to Europe. Their parents lived much closer to the bone because times were a lot different. You didn't travel that way, didn't have the labor-saving devices in your homes. You know, you got paid even relative to inflation a lot less and yet they managed to save money. So I think it was a combination of the two things, frankly. I said earlier today that when my parents were married in 1938 after my father had saved a few hundred hours working hard, they'd courted for five years, and I asked my mother what her dream was when they left town in their 1934 Ford, and, and they had the surveying rods tied to the side because my dad was going to the next construction site. And she laughed and said, my dream was that your father would have a job the next week. Those were the circumstances in which those people were growing up. They didn't take anything for granted because they could not, frankly. Now, you know, young people use their 20s to find themselves. Um, <laughs> they move easily from job to job to job. We get a lot of applicants who come in and want a job. And the second question is, so what's the vacation schedule here? You know, that kind of thing. It's just different. and and. It doesn't mean that we're worse off now. I really don't necessarily believe that. I think that we are an extraordinarily prosperous, powerful place. We just have to talk to each other and to our children and have more of a dialogue, I think, generally about how we do want to be remembered and how we want to be measured on a daily basis. And this book has certainly uh, provided a catalyst in my own life for thinking about that a lot more. And based on my own experiences as I go around the country, it's prompted a lot of other people to think about it too. Mr. Eastwood, uh, what do you feel to be your most personally rewarding achievement in your career? 
survival. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just having a career, acting uh, in, in motion pictures, or anywhere for that matter, is, is a job that, you're, they, that is a holdover from the Depression era. It's a, a job where you, you're always, there's a joke among actors that you're always thinking every job is your last one. And so, uh, so actors are tremendously needy for that one reason. And for me to be still doing it 47 years later, is, is to me uh, uh, kind of a miraculous when I look back and I think, uh, how did that happen? Because I was only supposed to work for, I, I, I had a very disappointing early part of my career. I, I, I started out as a contract player with Universal and I was thrown out of there after a year and a half. And then I, 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 I was adrift for about three or four years and didn't get any jobs or got very few. You were digging so, swimming pools. I you? did that. I did swimming <laughs> pools and everything. And I didn't have a cell phone to call my agent or anything. <laughs> I, I, at, at lunchtime, I'd have to run down to the uh, drugstore and put in a, a, a coin, probably a dime then, and call the agent and uh, find out any, any news, no news, okay, back digging. digging. It was hot in Encino in those days. <laughs> but um, those, are, those are things people did, and as an actor, you almost have to have a second vocation. You have to, most of the actors you find around Los Angeles who are not, uh, not uh, well-known are usually working as waiters and all, all kinds of different things, selling real estate and what have you. And if you get lucky, and you're lucky enough to make a steady income in that job, then that's, that's uh, terrific. But... Um, D dating back to the uh, to our depression year era, th that was an era that I'm sure our parents would have w would have loved to have had uh, uh, years to find themselves and do all these kind of things, and uh, and they 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 tried to give us what they didn't have themselves from their parents, and we're trying to give our kids what we what what uh, what our parents couldn't give to us. Unfortunately, sometimes our kids are grown up. Uh, uh, with no appreciation for uh, the things and not having to w to work for anything, it's a very very uh, it's a big dilemma for for all of us in society nowadays. No matter what income bracket you're in, is most kids have way too much and uh, didn't have to really work for it. Tom Brokaw, of all the people you've interviewed, who's the smartest, uh, the the most you would trust, and three, who has had the most influence on your life and on the world big ticket item. I think most people expect that when I um, when I'm asked that question about who's memorable, who's the smartest, they expect uh, one of the bigger names that I've, you know, Mikhail Gorbachev. I was the first American journalist to interview him and and for a long time he thought I was the only American journalist which I was trying to, uh, a myth I was not going to keep going. Uh, uh, he was obviously a smart man or Bobby Kennedy or uh, Richard Nixon, obviously a very smart man, and a lot of people were at the top. But true story, the people who really made the biggest impression on me over the years are the are the people who are below the radar screen, so to speak, in terms of uh, international or national attention. Uh, research scientists, uh, civil rights workers in the South, uh, people that I got to know uh, when I was covering uh, events in Africa, both in uh, South Africa and in Somalia. Uh, people that, whose names, I can't even recall all of them, but they were there uh, fulfilling uh, real needs, doing it brilliantly and without any need for personal attention. So those are the people that have left the biggest impression on my life, frank on my life, frankly, because it always helps me put things in context, if you will. Uh, you know, you get a fair amount of attention because you're on television. Um, but when I go off to uh, a laboratory in this country where they're doing work in cancer research, or when I go into a, a ward of a hospital where a doctor is doing something about a childhood disease of some kind, and no one knows who that doctor is except the people in that immediate vicinity, Frankly, I'm in awe of what they're doing, and it puts in perspective the kind of public attention that I get, and, and it helps a lot. It also helps a lot that I live in a matriarchy. I have a, a strong, accomplished wife and three daughters, who I'm always pleased when they 
have a fair idea of what it is that I do on a daily basis. You know, <laughs> are you still on television, Dad? Oh, good, good. <laughs> and uh, kind of goes from there. So there's, there's, there's not a lot of star treatment around my house, which helps a lot. <laughs> I just wanted to tell one quick story, if I can, about my father and the perspective that he managed to keep in my life as well. When I was growing up, my dad made in the very best years of his life maybe $5,000 a year, but he always managed to save money. My mother worked, and we always had everything that we needed. We were never poor. We were always working class, and things that needed to get fixed got fixed, and when there was time to go to college, there was, a, uh, there was money there for me to go to school. Uh, my life obviously changed. I began earning a fairly good wage early on, and then I got to a certain threshold at NBC when I signed a very big contract, my first big one. And it was at a time when all of us were going into a new stratosphere, as it were, in uh, television news, and it began to get into the press. And my father called me and said, I've been reading about your salary. Is that true? And I said, God, Dad, we've never talked about my salary before. We're not going to start now. I, I just don't want to talk about this. So we went on to other subjects. And about two weeks later, Time Magazine came out and printed my salary and Dan's and Peter's and everybody else's in pretty vivid detail. The phone rang, it was my father. <laughs> and he says, so I've got Time Magazine here. Uh, and they've got your salary in there, they say. Is that true? <laughs> and I said, well, Dad, God, you've never asked me about my salary before. Why would you start now? And he said, well, I'll tell you why I'm starting now. He said, your mother and I are sitting here doing our budget for the next year, and as long as we've known you, you've always come up a little bit short. We need to know how much to put in for this year. <laughs> Two weeks later, I was in California. We had bought our, my parents a retirement home. And my dad followed me down the stairs of this home, which he dearly loved, and out into the street with Meredith at my side, and it was the first daughter that he'd ever had, and he loved her so dearly. And one of the few times in my life I saw him with tears in his eyes, and he said, I can't take this. We have to work out a schedule for us to pay for this. And Meredith did the smartest thing she could possibly have done. She broke out laughing and put her arms around my dad and said, you may not believe this, but we can't spend it all without your help. <laughs> <laughs> we are, uh, I'm getting the, uh, the, the signal that you get every evening, I'm sure, which is that uh, we've reached the end of this session. Uh, and I, I just want to say this has been just a delightful session. And would you please join me in thanking our two guests for participating. <laughs>